Um, our next uh, our next speaker is Philip um, Nkrumah from um, from uh, CLMR, who is going to talk about uh, a topic near and dear to my heart, which I think is is incredibly um, incredibly interesting. Uh, phyto phyto mining. Um, yes, Philip's online, and um, if you would like to uh, share your screen, Philip, and get your presentation up, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's good. That's uh, that's come up. Okay, I'll let you uh, let you run with that, Philip. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah, I'm going to present on polymetallic phyto extraction of uh, metalliferous soils from Queensland, and I'm doing this uh, project along with Anthony Van der Rens and uh, Peter Esken, and we have some other uh, RHD candidates, Roger and Emilia, also supporting alongside. So it's going to be very brief progress about how far you've gone with the uh, complex all body project. I'll briefly touch on uh, the tailings material generation. I think in the morning, yeah, there have been quite a number of talk on that. And our plants in mining regions, how valuable are they? And I'm going to present on our progress and future outlook. So we are all aware of the uh, global demand for critical metals. And as this uh, demand goes side, there is the need for us to supply these metals. Unfortunately, there is a declining ore grade at very high rates and metal production needs to go on. So what happens is that there is a generation of high amount of waste all around the world and this waste uh, needs to be dealt with. And all around the world in uh, mining regions, there are also uh, soils that are quite enriched in metals. And these soils are known as uh, metalliferous soils. And these metal enriched soils also host specific plants that are called metallophytes. These plants are well adapted to the high metal concentrations. They're able to tolerate the metal content. Normal plants cannot do that. So these plants growing in these um, regions, the, the exhibit three main strategies to deal with the high metal content. So we have, we, we've grouped them into three that exclude us. Excluders are able to exclude uh, the metals from the shoots. They're able to tolerate the metals in the soil, but they don't take it up into the shoot. And we have bio indicators. These are plants with uh, shoot metal concentration that reflect the concentrations in the soil and we have hyper accumulator plants. These are able to take up extraordinary concentrations of metals in their shoots without suffering any toxicity symptoms. So these plants are very valuable in these uh, mining regions. I think uh, this morning, Laura was mentioning how mining affects uh, this biodiversity, but we can also derive our uh, important uh, strategies from these plants and we have very specific plants. These are hyperaccumulator plants and they accumulate so much metal so that with some trees, when you actually sc uh, scrape the back, they exude metal. So what you are seeing on the screen now is a nickel hyperaccumulator plant and this um, sap contains about 250,000 ppm nickel. So it's very outrageous and we can actually uh, tap into this for innovative uh, phyto extraction. So these uh, valuable metals needs to be recognized as very vital assets, especially at the development stage of a mining operation. What happens is that uh, most mining companies neglect this and they, are able, they sometimes destroy all these uh, valuable plants, which could probably be useful in biogeochemical uh, prospecting, actually the highest zinc uh, ore grade in, in the world was actually discovered in Australia using uh, biogeochemical prospecting and that's in uh, central Queensland. And these plants, because they're also able to tolerate high concentrations of metals in the soil rather than uh, normal 
plant. These plants are very useful in our mine site rehabilitation. And we also have a very innovative approach for this plant called phyto extraction, where we actually tap into the high concentrations of this plant to make a valuable product from, from them. So uh, we, we, we collaborate with other institutions to actually produce metal salts, which are very critical in the um, green economy. So within our central Queensland, we've done quite intensive uh, studies and some of these plants could actually reflect the, 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 the buried ore deposits. So in, in, in the lines that you see on the, on the screen, this actually delineates where the, the ore, ore body is quite enriched in the, in the metal. So this is our copper enriched soils in, in the Rosby corridor in Queensland. So these plants actually give an indication. So when you were actually prospecting for, for copper or for zinc or for nickel or for any other rare earth element, what we normally do is you can just um, go to the site and explore the, the plants. Most often the, the concentrations in the plants for bio indicators, the concentrations in the plants actually reflect what is in the soil. So this is a really useful tool, very cost effective, just using plant, uh, uh, just taking leaf and analyzing and you're able to see the buried um, or deposits. This has been used in uh, finding gold for finding copper, for finding zinc and many other um, elements. So this is very useful. So metallophytes are really essential. And as I mentioned earlier, we have this innovative approach called uh, phyto extraction or phyto mining, where we cultivate these hyperaccumulator plants on metal rich soils. We harvest the biomass, incinerate or directly extract the metal and we recover actually uh, salts that can actually uh, be useful in the green economy. So this is just uh, illustrating that for cobalt, we have hyperaccumulator plants, you grow them on mine waste and we're able to produce bio oil, we call it bio oil. And that bio oil, it's really enriched in, in the metal and we produce um, cobalt sulfate, which is a pure salt and we, we can produce many other products. So our story so far with the complex oil body, actually in uh, recently we discovered an Australian native uh, species that is well adapted to the climatic conditions in central Queensland. It is really um, drought tolerant and it's able to tolerate various uh, kinds of metals, not only one, but different kinds of metal. And I'm really going to touch on this. And this is found in uh, central Queensland. And these plants, they produce really high biomass. So they are very useful and they are legumes. So what that means is they are able to make their own food so they can survive in really degraded environment. And this is really useful for biogeochemical prospecting. It's useful for mine site rehabilitation. It's useful for phyto extraction. So this is really an ideal I do traits that any, any uh, fighter extraction person will be looking out for. So this is really ideal in Australia. So this plant, just to give a quick background, the soils on which they grow, it's, it's really highly enriched in metals, contain about 25,000 lead, 18,000 zinc, 2,700 uh, ppm of copper. And within the plant, they are able to tolerate. So you, you could see that the plant is highly tolerant to these um, soils. Actually, normal plants cannot survive in these conditions. And the plants are able to take up at least 480 ppm lead and uh, about 16,200 ppm of zinc, which is really exceptional. Actually, even with the hyperaccumulation threshold for zinc, it's capped at... Uh, 3,000, but these plants really exceed and, and, and really go beyond. So this extremely high concentration of zinc in the foliar, in the foliar uh, matter can really be tapped. And these plants can also take up very high concentration of copper and they are really useful. Probably for copper, zinc and lead, they may not be quite useful um, 
in terms of their metal, but we can explore other, other products around it, or we could just use it for phytostabilization of uh, mine site rehabilitation, or we could just tap into it and use it to prospect for metals. What this plant does is that when it's growing on normal soils, it doesn't take anything, but when it's growing on metallifer soils, it takes up something. So it really gives us an indication that when you analyze the leaf of this and it contains something, that means there is something in the soil which is really useful. So we took up, uh, we, we collected some germplasm and doing some, um, did some experiments in the glass out just to dose them at various uh, concentrations to see their, their behavior. And we actually realized that th th there is that, there, there is that dose response. So as you increase the dose, they, they, they also increase in the concentration. And as I said, this is really useful because if there is zero zinc in the soil, that means the plant also has zero or like there is there's normal concentrations in the plant. But when you increase the dose rate, you realize that the, the accumulation pattern also increases. And this is useful, especially for geobotanical prospecting. So as I said, you could just go to the field, collect the leaf, and if there is something in the leaf, then there got to be something in the soil. And soil also, as you may know, it derives its uh, geochemical properties from the ore. So it's, it's a nice uh, linkage and you could, through this, you, you can discover an ore body. So this is really, um, really essential plants. And we also conducted um, some hydroponic study to see whether these plants are also able to tolerate uh, cadmium because cadmium and zinc are mostly associated and in high zinc environment, in most cases, you also find high cadmium and cadmium is extremely toxic so how can we deal with uh, calcium toxicity? So we, we conducted this hydroponics and we realized that these plants are able to take about 3000 ppm of cadmium in the foliar concentrations when they are just growing in uh, 60 micromolar cadmium solution. So this is really useful for cadmium remediation. We, we know how toxic cadmium could be. So if you got plant that can be able to extract cadmium from the soil, this is really useful for progressive mine site rehabilitation. Then we also did some macro XRF uh, studies on this to really see the distribution of uh, the various elements in the, in, the, in the plant. And this is a young uh, seedling. And we see that for zinc, there is high uptake in the, in the roots. And this is being transported to the mature leaves and then there is that phloem redistribution that takes the, 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 the zinc from the mature leaf to, to, to developing tissues such as young leaves and we see the, the, that of uh, potassium where it is enriched and where it is depleted and we see that of also calcium. Potassium and calcium they are physiologically important elements so we, 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 we try to analyze this and understand the distribution so that we could develop an effective agronomic system for this. And we see that for the, for the iron, we see that in the iron, it is mainly bound to the roots and it doesn't translocate it to the shoot. So this is very essential. We, we know that with iron, it can mobilize it in the roots, but it doesn't translocate it. So it's very essential even for high iron um, and rich soils if you want to remediate. You, you keep the iron in the in the soil or you, you bound it to the root and it will not translocate to the shoot. So this is very important. And when we take a closer look at the at the mature leaf, we, we see the distribution very clearly that in the lamina, the, the, the zinc is really enriched, whereas in the vein, it is depleted. And we see that in mature leaves, there is high concentration and in the young leaves, there is that low concentration, but at least there is that zinc translocation also to the young leaf. And it's very important. All these are really useful to understand the hyperaccumulation phenomenon. They are useful in applying this, the, the lessons we gain from this to, to, to also develop some other biofortified crops. And it's really important that we understand 
the mechanisms by which our zinc is distributed in the, in the plant. And we also analyzed uh, the effect of cadmium on the leaf. We, we see that with the zinc only treatment, the, 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 the distribution of zinc in the, in the leaf and with cadmium and zinc treatment, they are different. So there is something that is ongoing that we need to really uh, dig deep into. That means there is an effect of cadmium on, on, on zinc distribution and we need to really dig deep into this, how cadmium affects zinc uptake and transport. And this is um, another aspect of what you have been looking at, we, uh, thallium. We, we've realized that thallium is a very um, toxic element. It's actually more toxic than cadmium or mercury. However, in the natural soil, it's quite uh, low. It's about the, the maximum you can get is around 3 ppm um, thallium. But in enriched soils, it could be up to or more than uh, 5 ppm. And when thallium concentrations in soil exceed 5 ppm, then it poses a severe threat to public and environmental health. On the other hand, thallium is also a critical metal that has really high value. It has really high economic value compared to nickel, compared to zinc, compared to even cobalt. Thallium is really essential and very, very um, costly. So what we, we are recent uh, field trips to central Queensland, what we've discovered is that the gosan in central Queensland is actually highly enriched as, as with, when we compare it with literature, that's the highest we could come across so far. But not much is being done in this uh, aspect, in this area. Thallium is highly enriched. The gosan contains about 1,000 ppm thallium. That is extremely high. And in the tailings, um, it's, you, we, 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 we could measure between uh, 30 and 75 uh, ppm of, of thallium, which is really critical. And we, we need to really pay particular attention to it. But thallium in Australia has not been really explored. So what we are doing with that is that we have um, a thallium hyperaccumulator plant, Biscutella, which has been discovered in France, and uh, it's able to take up more than 15,000 ppm of thallium when it's growing on soils with less than 30 ppm thallium. So compared to the Queensland soils uh, in central Queensland that are quite highly enriched, we could see that there is even high potential that this, this plant could really take up even more concentrations. So we did some uh, hydroponics and we want to see the, the distribution of thallium and other physiological important elements so that we can be able to develop a, a robust um, agronomic system for phyto extraction. So we, we see the distribution, how it resembles uh, that of potassium. And uh, we see that the calcium is enriched in the trichomes. And it's really pretty how, how, how all these um, come to play and their, their potential use. So this is really an uh, important field that, that this uh, complex all body has opened up. And with future uh, funding, we are able to really dig deep into uh, thallium factor extraction or uh, as like learning about this hyperaccumulation in thallium as we, we, we may have an idea, this thallium, the, the brassicaceae family like cabbage and other uh, food crops are also able to take up this thallium. So when we're able to get, know how, how the hyperaccumulation of thallium actually operates, then we can be able to apply this knowledge in that field. So a quick uh, outlook on what uh, needs to be done, we, 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 we've realized that for what we have done so far provides really a strong baseline information for further experiments. We need to undertake a synchrotron-based uh, X-ray fluorescence microscopy to actually see the subcellular distribution of zinc in this ideal uh, plant. We need to also know the speciation of zinc in this plant. And we need to also develop agronomic systems after we, we, we've seen all these uh, mechanisms. You need to develop agronomic systems and uh, control conditions reflecting that of uh, the central Queensland. And finally, we need to uh, take up a field work in central Queensland, actually to demonstrate this in the field. 
then we've realized that this ideal plant is really useful for zinc, lead, and copper prospecting. And it can also be used in our mine site rehabilitation. And the lessons that we learned from this, we could actually apply it to even normal crops in zinc biofortification because we see how the zinc is translocated to, to, to the grain and to, 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 to the flowers and to developing tissues. And we actually can use these mechanisms and try to do genetic modification in normal crops to enhance the, the zinc in, in normal crops. Actually, we are, most of us are aware of the zinc uh, deficiency problem all around the world, especially in uh, developing countries where people really uh, depend on grains and cereals for, for food. Yep, and what is even more innovative about our future direction is that we're going to explore how to extract uh, zinc oxide from these uh, hyperaccumulator plants. And you may know that zinc oxide is really common in our sunscreen. So in the future, in natural sunscreen, you, you explore how plants could actually be used in producing zinc oxide for our sunscreens. Yep, and with the thallium hyperaccumulation, it also has really high prospecting for zinc and lead because thallium actually, they, they are associated with zinc and lead. So if you are able to discover more thallium, we, we can use that to trace um, zinc and lead all bodies. Then thallium contaminated uh, mine sites, as I said, thallium is highly toxic, the, one of the most toxic elements in the world. So if you're able to deal with, with it, then it's really useful. Actually, it's not being tackled in Australia. Not much is known in that space. So it's really good that we could get a chance to really research into that. And as I said, uh, cabbage and other uh, brassicaceae, food crops in the brassicaceae family also take up um, thallium and that could pose um, food safety risk to, um, that could uh, pose food uh, safety risk to humans. So there is the, and animals and there is the need for us to really explore into that space. So finally, we going to look at how we could develop a conceptual uh, framework on the, how, how this polymetallic factor mining fits into the um, circular economy. Yeah, and we have uh, quite a number of manuscripts still under preparation and very soon we're going to uh, submit them. Yep, so thank you once again for your attention and questions are welcome, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Philip. That's uh, it's fascinating and so many uh, applications from uh, mineral exploration to uh, mine site rehabilitation and, and in fact, ideally, I guess, uh, actual mining itself. So thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, look, we, we, I think we'll hold questions for you as well until, until the end, if that's all right. We're, we're still running uh, quite a bit over time. So thank you very much for that, um, for that, uh, that talk, thanks. And thank if you could you. just unscrew and share your screen, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.